Stuart Liebig. <laughs> we'll be, the music will get there any moment. Here it comes.
I'm going to slide out now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is Stuart Liebig, my guest today. You know, so cool listening to this kind of material. And it always kills me that um, it's, you know, it kills me that um, when you're doing it or listening to it, whatever, that that several people can meet at the same junction, you know, like and right. actually be doing really the same thing. It's just it's kind of, it's an incredible reality that happens, doesn't it? Uh, I like to think so. Um, I don't know. You know, it, Vinny and I have played together a long time. So, um, which is not to say that I don't always have to like try to bring more than my A game to to keep up with him. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, people have said to me like, "How did you guys like get to that same harmonic thing at the same point?" And like, uh, you know, we're trying to listen and hopefully we get to the right place. But yeah, I mean, it's 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 a special thing if you find people you can. Um, um, have that rapport with you know yeah so <clears throat> Stuart is a pretty fabulous musician artist and um yeah i think i'm i'm a uh, very um inspired by your music you know oh thanks <laughs> so it's really quite nice and you did did you say you have another career that you do as well oh yeah you know uh I, I used to make sort of a living playing top 40 and all these gigs and all that stuff. And um, I started to just like it pretty well. And um, uh, I didn't like being wallpaper. So I figured I'd just get a job where I didn't really care about it too much. Yeah. You know, and, and I could just do the music I wanted to. So um, yeah, I copy edit for, for companies right now. I see. And, um, it's, it's been pretty good. Cause like I had, like I told you earlier, I had twins and I got, I got into that line of work right about the time that my wife and I knew we were going to have twins. So it's helped, you know, pay the mortgage and feed kids and all that other stuff. So um, that's good, you know, and also I used to work two jobs sometimes so I could make the money to put out the CDs I've done. So I, I you know, I, I've, I've used it for um, for my own uh, needs. So to yeah, speak. yeah. And um, have you always, have you always been a uh, bass player? Were you, yeah i mean the um the answer is is the first serious instrument i started playing was electric bass um but then i got a guitar and um strangely enough i ended up playing rhythm guitar with les mccann for like three years yeah i know people go like what wow well, that's, I, that's... I met him when i was about 18 and i did uh it was basically a friend used to have like dinners on Wednesday night and he would show up when he wasn't on the road. There was a girl playing, you know, it was kind of like a jam session. There was this girl playing bass. I said, well, I'm not going to try to usurp her thing. I'll just bring a guitar. And then Les and I kind of hit it off. And um, I ended up going, uh, I did a recording with him uh, for one tune on an album. And then I ended up going on the road with him for three years. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's kind of a thing. I learned a lot from Les. Les was a um, um, uh, father figure of sorts to me and um but then I went back to I just said look I, I I'm not super happy playing guitar uh I went to Northridge and I I studied classical like orchestra bass oh. which I hadn't really done until then um and I did that and I got my degree in that and then I was like yeah I'm not sure I'm gonna be like you know the eighth chair in a not very good orchestra and play a bunch of stuff <laughs> I wanted to play I'm gonna form a rock band right but during that whole time period, I played with, like in high school, I played with John Beasley. Uh, I was, and then um, I, a friend of mine, a couple of friends of mine knew Billy Childs, and I subbed in a band that he had with Diane Reeves for a while. So I was kind of doing that stuff. Plus, I got in with the whole like Vinnie Golia, Nels Klein, Wayne Pete crew, um, right when I went back to Northridge. I'd actually met Nels in 1975 at the Santa Monica College Jazz Band. Huh. So some of these people I've known for a long time, you know, yeah. Nell's almost 50 years. God, that's amazing. <laughs> that's so weird. <laughs> yeah, it's like 1975. Oh, shit. That's, oh, sorry. I don't know if I can say that, but, you, can. Um, you know, so, um, you know, um, so I, I did this rock band, but then I started like, I was playing with Wayne and Nell's in a couple of different things. And then I went on the road with this guy, Julius Hemphill. That was through Alex. So I did a bunch of European tours with him. Um, 
plus doing the rock band and you know so i just i sort of had all these weird things going on that i figured i would give a little bit of a cv as they call it um <laughs> but that's that's sort of my my thing you yeah. know and then the rock band had an album come out and then it blew up and you know I, I said no more to um worrying so much about uh what I was calling the entertainment combine at that point, you know, I got burned out by I got, I got burned out by lawyers and record companies and and people lying to you when they're when they already know what's going on. Oh yeah, we're taking care of you guys now. You already decided to shelve the album, stuff like that. Yeah. So um, yeah, I, I, I took a hard left into what I'm doing now, more or less. So so would you just call what you're doing now your own art, or I mean, is there I like, guess so. I mean, that's, that's, you know, I, I, my friend Nathan Hubbard says we just follow our nose and I, and, and we were having discussion about this. And I think that's kind of it because I also studied, like did a lot of self-study on like classical composition. Like I analyzed Beethoven string quartets and I kind of like tried to write, you know, symphony pieces and orchestra and, and like string quartets and stuff like that. So um, I just kind of gone where, where I want where I was interested, like I was really into like doing synthesizer stuff in the eighties. And now I'm really into doing synthesizer stuff now. And like, how do I, it's just, for me, it's, it's trying to make, you know, music that I find interesting. Um, so, uh, you know, like when we were talking about like what to pick for this, there's a whole lot going on in there. Yeah. But, you have a lot, a lot of things listed. Well, at least listed in your bio and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I that's, all Nathan, sweet. that's all AI. It's all BS. <laughs> Joking. Sorry. That's okay. I talked to Nathan a few weeks ago on on the show. Right on. We we had a nice conversation. That was yeah, great. He's a, he's a really smart uh, and uh, also prolific and sort of wide range of things he's interested in. Yeah, you know, yeah. He's, he's very nice. And jazz and... I actually was introduced to him through my friend Rick Helzer. Do you know Rick? I know of Rick. He's a San Diego pianist. Is that right? He had lived in San Diego for a long time and taught there. And now he's back. His hometown is was Fresno, ah. and, but he's very he's a very progressive player. Right um, yeah, and uh, nice person and stuff. And um, so he introduced me to Nathan and um, yeah, and of course Vinny, who we just saw with you. Um, I've been doing these um, <laughs> second Thursday of the month. Right. Free, or free new music at Kulaks and Vinny's been playing with his band it's just, um, for me it's thrilling I still have yet to inspire uh, an audience even you know an audience who's into the music you know it's kind of it's right. hard to reach people right I, I've seen a couple I've seen that you were doing those I was uh, out of town for a couple of them I think so yeah I try to get my my uh, phones out there at some point North Hollywood, is that right? North Hollywood, very easy location. Yeah. Laurel Canyon and Magnolia. Okay. It's really good. Really, it's great. And his band is uh, made up of his previous students. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. really good. Yeah, I've seen I've seen him do that, yeah. Yeah, very and nice. Miller, Miller's really good. Both Miller and Clint are really good. Yeah. There's so, there's so much different music to get into. I mean, when I think about how long I've known Vinny and gone to see him, right. it was ages ago, it was like 50 years ago or whatever, right you know, when I first came to town. And, but then of course I went off on my own sure. trail and, and now here, I, it seems here I am again, <laughs> getting a little more in, involved and interested in more improvisatory sure. music, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, it makes sense to me. I mean, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not going to uh, keep continue. <laughs> I don't have much to say about. Well, you know, I, I think I think that um, you know a, a lot of music comes out of improvisation, just like basically screwing around. You know, I I, I can make a case that basically Mozart and Beethoven and probably you know, Bach and possibly some others, but I think all those guys were great improvisers and I think that they developed their music out of that. Yeah. You know, you get people like Ellington or Wayne Shorter, yeah. you know, or even like if you've seen the Paul McCartney stuff where they're in, in that movie, Get Back. I mean, it's sort of like he's messing around and all of a sudden he starts flowing out of it, you know? Um, and, and so I think that's really sort of the, the, 
the beginning of a lot of stuff is just sort of the improvisational messing around and then finding a thread that you like. Um, the difference between those people and what like the Vinnie and I clip is that we just like do it in front of a live audience and pretend that people are the, I want to hear it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like let, let's 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 watch like let's watch the high wire act and, and hopefully don't they don't fall too far, you know. <laughs> well, you know, seriously, that's sort of where it's at, you know. And, it you is. Know, I it is. Hope do we don't you, suck. No, you're I, I couldn't agree more. In fact, Years ago, I found a book by Stephen Nachmanovich, mm -hmm. Free Play, Improvisation and Life in the Arts. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of became my Bible. It was, it was, interestingly enough, it was the same time period that Kenny Werner came out with his book. Uh -huh. okay. And then last year, they both came out with a second book, uh -huh. um, which I thought was really interesting. But anyway, Stephen is... Um, he knows people you know, like Ellen Burr. He knows Ellen Burr. Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah, so he's an improvisational violinist and huh. and a teacher, coach of improvisation. Oh, you know? yeah. And the book is great. You know, it's because it really shows you that there's a connection. You know, you, you have to, you're always improvising. It doesn't matter if you call it improvising or not. You wake up in the morning, you're improvising from that point yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. For sure, absolutely. So, yeah. we're improvising I, right now, right? We are. <laughs> oh my god, I'm nervous. You, you know, I, I want to. I want to say that, like, one of the uh, one of the uh, guiding thing for me recently is this uh, painter named Gerhard Richter, and there's this there's this uh, video of him painting called Richter painting, and basically, it's almost a complete improvisational process he goes through. He starts with he starts with like doing brush stuff and then okay. he starts laying paint on he's doing all this stuff and by the end it looks nothing like you know he starts out with red and there's no red at the end but he's just about layers and then he just finally goes yeah that's not it or yeah i finally finished and you know he no he, he it, it, it's been really interesting just because i'm so into the process of how he gets it because i love the painting so to me this is sort of part of the same thing as i think you know you're talking about people who are maybe start with a little idea and then they just flesh it out and pretty soon they're at some place completely different and, and magical almost, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's my thing. Yeah, definitely. Well, you're, you're, <coughs> hold on one minute. I'm just turning on my fan. Huh. <coughs> a little warm in my room. <coughs> um, your sound goes through a lot of different qualities. <coughs> Obviously, <coughs> you've experimented and looked around and investigated your your your, your sound, the sound that right. you had, and you have right. you have a board, uh, right? A football. Well, board. yeah, but like you know, the thing <laughs> that I was just, in, in the Vinny thing that you just played, I basically have three fuzz pedals that I'm using that I can blend uh the the clean and dirty sound through and then i can get different so like there's a little bit where i had some controlled feedback going on for like 30 seconds and i can kind of change it that's how i'm doing stuff like that so um part of what for me the challenge with electric bass is first off uh, besides the fact that not many people are using it in this kind of music um is that you know when you talk about something like Vinny, they can change a note with um as it's going on, they can they can modulate it. Or if you have a bow when you're playing violin or upright bass or what have you, you can do that. So so my challenge has been to trying to learn how to do that with electric bass. So that's how I kind of came up with that. And then, you know, there's a um, you know, there's like prepared piano, there's different techniques with you know different instruments. And I'm trying to sort of do some of that with electric bass so I can get a lot of different sounds. I think at the beginning of that thing, I'm probably just beating the crap out of the strings with, with something, you know, cause I'm trying to get a more percussive, aggressive sound, you know? And so a lot of what I'm trying to do, I think is um, develop the electric bass as an instrument that can have a lot of different emotional or timbral um, variations that I can control. And I think that's, um, which sounds really highfalutin and pretentious, but that's where it is, you know? I don't think it sounds pretentious at all. 
Well, there's probably electric bass players who might listen and go, but dude, where's the groove? And I think I can groove okay, you know, but um, that's not what I'm trying to do in that thing with, with Vinny, you know. Um, we were talking earlier, I have this band called The Mentones, which is basically sort of like Little Walter meets Ornette Coleman. And sometimes I'm just playing literally the same three note or whatever ostinato for five minutes while everybody else goes berserk and sometimes but there's a lot of groove involved in that and also demolishing the groove so um you know it's it's all about what's what's right for um the moment music you know and and for me that means i'm the composer in the mentone so i get to i get to decide what i do we definitely i want to hear i want to hear something yeah okay um, well, I'll, but, I'll try to, i'll try to come up with a good cut you know um um but yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, in fact, yesterday I had a bass player on, Rene Camacho. Okay. And, <clears throat> you know, he's he plays, he's played with all kinds of genres, although I don't think improvisational, particularly like you do. But he is playing with Kevin Eubanks, and they, yeah, uh -huh. they actually live, they really go out, man. Well, that's really? cool. Yeah, far out. And so, <clears throat> but we were talking about groove. And of course, you know, in the in a more standard application, bass is responsible for the groove, for the time, and, yeah. you know, for the root of the chord. And, you know. Right. But, <clears throat> yeah, so that's pretty interesting because, um, yeah, you're just, I mean, it's all good, isn't it? You know, you're well, doing... Yeah, you know, but here, here's my thing about, um, I think I, I get, I've gotten into arguments with this, uh, with people about this on um, various, you know, internet things, which is not hard to get into fights with people. But my feeling is like, the electric bass in particular has been made into something more functional than it has to be. It's good that it's functional, but like, if you, what's the bass in a string quartet? It's a cello, right? So the cello sometimes plays ostinatos, it's playing roots, it's playing melodies, it's playing counterpoint, you know, same thing with like a bassoon, you know, I mean, trombones, I mean, basically the bass instrument in any given situation can do a lot of different things. And, and that's kind of what, I, if I have a little sort of evangelical mission, it's it's partially showing that it can do different things. And, you know, I play six string bass, so it also gets into chordal stuff. You know, I have extra low notes, you know, so I can fill it up, like try to fill it up a little bit like a pipe organ, you know, or I can do higher, you know, stuff. So for me, I'm trying to develop more of an orchestral approach. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it's like, it doesn't have to be just functional. Yeah. My, you know, well, that's my, that's my approach. I'm curious, and I don't want to, you know, open a Pandora's sure. box, but I am curious. What could you possibly fight about? <laughs> about that with that? Oh, well, because <laughs> you, you. <laughs> I'm just gonna say there is a certain strata of electric bass players that are very conservative, almost to a fundamentalist point of view about what the instrument can do. Oh. Oh yeah, it's like root fifth, nothing else, nothing below like a, a an E on the D string. I mean, just like it, they have all these rules oh. in their heads. And <laughs> but the funny thing is, for me, is that like you know who are their their my favorite player is John Entwistle. Okay, he did none of that. What did you like about him? He had like <laughs> his own style that he wasn't like you know completely kissing. Townsend's ass, you know, you have Jack Bruce, all these guys they like, they're all like from the 60s and 70s. But for some reason, they can't branch their heads out. So no, I've gotten in arguments with people about this stuff. It's it's kind of weird. Yeah, that is kind of weird. It is. <laughs> so, um, not exactly like politics or something, you know? <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> no. You know, they, they want it to be the way they grew up, except for it's not really the way they grew up. So I, anyway, um, <laughs> so anyway, I sort of I sort of went on a tangent about the the, um, the groove thing, you know, because to me, it's all, you know, it's like what's right for the piece of music. And yeah, the, the, the exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I want to hear the Mentones. Can I look on YouTube or do you want to send me some? You no, know, it's, it's on it's on YouTube. Uh, if you look for a tune called. Um, uh, well, maybe lightning bug's a good one. I can try to see if I can find that. 
I hear. I I'm I'm here. <clears throat> Lightning bug. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the have, top one. Okay, so this is the uh this is an audio. Yeah, it's audio only, yeah. Okay, let's do it. A Bo Diddley group. it yeah so um cool mentons the mentons yeah um so you know uh bill barrett's on chromatic harmonica he's um insane he's doing stuff not particularly on this tune but <laughs> i've never heard anybody do on chromatic harmonica not that i've spent you know a million years doing it um very uh studious guy studied a lot of different um, musics. Like he'll go like, I'm gonna do a John Dowland uh, loop pieces on harmonica. So he's <laughs> saying, Tony um, is a guy who uh, has done a lot in the punk rock scene, like the SST things. And then Joe, the drummer is, um, you know, as, as somebody else mentioned, he's got like a, a resume that's as long as your arm. And um, so I'm not gonna try to go into it, but he's played with people like, and Magnuson, he has his own band uh, with Kira Volman called Non Credo. He just did a solo disc that's 
um, great. He has a wow. band called Double Knot Spy Car. So he has, he's done, he was in a band, a legendary band called the Fibonacci's in LA. So, um, you know, uh, I kind of started putting this band together in around 2000. So that's our first record. We've done three and then um, I did an offshoot of that band and then we did a, a combination of that band with the sextet of, of the two different things. But anyway, the whole idea was I had this, I was listening to a lot of early Arnett Coleman stuff. I'm going like, why were people so mad? This just uh, stuff just sounds like the blues to me. And I also happened to be listening to a lot of chess stuff. I go like, well, why do I do this? And so I talked to Tony because I'd seen him play and, <clears throat> and, uh, and I said, so harmonica players, he goes, Bill Barrett. And I talked to our friend Wayne Pete and I said, harmonica players, he says, Bill Barrett. And I go, I guess I better talk to Bill Barrett. Um, and so, you know, we all hit it off and, and, you know, these guys have all played together in other situations as well. Uh, oh. Wayne, by the way, recorded that. Um, oh. Recorded like 14 albums or something for me because he's an amazing guy and great ears. and you know, Great you know. engineer. And he, he recorded my, my group, The Moment, live at the Blue Whale. Yeah. And yeah. he does that pretty good too, huh? Yeah. <laughs> he's done a lot of people a solid in, the, in his life. He's, he's one of the best people I know. Yeah. Um, anyway, so that, that's the Mentones, which is pretty different than what the Vinny thing we just heard. Definitely. You know? Definitely. And what, what about Kaleidoscope? What's Kaleidoscope? Um, well, Kaleidoscope is... Um, so I did this, this project called Pomegranate, which is all like really long pieces, like I think 13, 12 or 13 is the shortest. And some is that of that the one that said something about Count Basie or something? No, 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 that, no. I don't have anything about Count Basie on that. Um, no, it said you meet Count ba What is your... your uh... Your bio said something about somebody meets Count Basie. Uh, I can't. Oh, well, that might have. Maybe somebody may have thought about that with the uh, the Mentot Six. I, I don't hear Count Basie in that, but I, I hear other people. You know, uh, Mingus and people like that. That I yeah, saw. yeah, okay. Um, uh, so no pomegranates. Like um, I basically had uh, some people I've been playing with, and then. Jeff Godier at, at Cryptogramophone, um, uh, I, I sort of was asking him to, you know, to have pity on me, put out an album on Cryptogramophone. And he said, and I had a band that he was in and he goes, yeah, I want to do something a little more special than that. I said, okay, um, well, how about this? I pitched him the most expensive thing possible. <laughs> so um, the band was um, Ellen Burr, who we mentioned earlier, uh, um, Jeff Godier, so Ellen's on flute, Jeff's on violin, um, uh, Eric Barger on clarinet, um, Scott Ray on trombone, John Fumo on trumpet, uh, yeah, um, Alex Klein on drums. That and then me. That's the core band. And then um, I did. I, I wrote um, sort of like mini concerti for four different people. One of was, was oh. Tom Barner, who's a French horn player who was then in New York but now uh, teaches up at Cornish, I think it is in um, Seattle. Vinny on one piece, um, Mark Dresser, the amazing uh, oh, yeah. bass player, and then uh, Nels Klein. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, basically we recorded uh, all those things and, um, you know, so anyway, the, the whole the whole Minim project was because I wanted to do something that was um, a contrast to these really large pieces. So basically, both um, Kaleidoscope and the other one, I don't even know those. But they're, they're, there's, there's Sulfur, that's one album is called Sulfur and the other is called uh, Quicksilver. Quicksilver is the first one. Okay. And the idea was to have really small pieces. So basically it's a quartet. The first one is uh, Ellen and Jeff and um, Jeanette Kangas who is playing percussion, drum set and, uh, uh, vibraphone and me um, and then the second one was Brad Dutes playing marimba and percussion and uh, Sarah Schoenbeck playing bassoon and Andrew Pass playing clarinet and, and bass clarinet and the whole idea was um, that I was going to do these small pieces for quartet but I was going to break them up into their component parts so there's four solos there's four trios there's six duos and and you know and a bunch of quartets all of which can, ends up being like 23 pieces. They're both 20, but they're all like maybe three minutes is the longest one, yeah. but I think it's more like in the tube. So they're all very short pieces. Um, 
and so that's what that's what that that stuff is uh, kaleidoscope and I'm spacing on the other one but um, that's that's why I did those is because I wanted something really short and they're much more like chamber yeah jazz third stream kind of stuff yeah if that makes sense is that, yeah. is that third <laughs> stream no, that's that's a um a uh, title that I don't use a lot. So what is third stream exactly? Is it well, hard or? Well, well, third stream, I think, is basically uh, the idea that you have something that melds uh, jazz or jazz-like um, elements, oh. uh, improvisation, and in quotes, classical music. So, um, oh. you know, um, so the idea is, is, you know, I have these structures that are written, but they don't sound like jazz. Like, they don't sound like, like the mentones at all. Yeah. It's not really jazz stuff. They all sound kind of like, you know, early 20th century classical music, but then there's improvisational sections in them. And that's sort of what I did with um, Pomegranate too. I sort of have that, and I was a band called Quartetto Stig and another band called Sig Tet, and that's all sort of what those do. They're, the Quartetto Stig had some, other more groove oriented stuff. So it kind of, it sounds a, a lot like classical, but it's actually improvised. Um, well, if you, how how deep you want to get into the structure of this? So basically, what I did, my the thing I wanted people to do in these things is I give them a small little bit to read and to play, yeah. and then the idea was to um, improvise in the style or with the thematic material that was presented in the writing, as opposed to okay, now you're gonna do this and now you can play like if you were playing Donna Lee. No, don't yeah. do that, play, play in the style of whatever that is. So if it's sort of, you know, sparse or, or you know, sparse and aggressive or long tones or whatever, try to weave in the improv, you know, so like on the Quartetto Stig thing, Kim Richmond once um, interviewed me on KXLU and he says, it's amazing how brave the writing is. I'm going like, dude, the writing is like eight measures and then it's everybody just improvising based on that. And that's where all the magic happened. I was just trying to set up little settings. So, you know, like a little, you have a ring and, you know, the ring has this and then the jewel is the improv. If that right, makes right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was long Linux again, sorry. Well, okay. That's what I'm trying to do with that. This reminds me of somebody I saw in your bio that you play with, which is Billy Mintz. Interesting, uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, I remember when Billy was doing, he invited, it was like an open invitation to bass players to come and like on a night, right? So there could be two to 30 bass players and he had a list and, you know, numbered list and one was uh, play in B minor as fast as you can, you know? <laughs> 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 So, so you've done projects with Billy too, right? Yeah, um, I did uh, two trio records uh, with uh, Vinny and Billy, and those were just like little short snippets I wrote, and then we play on them, you know. And then a couple, and a couple things on the. There was also just imp improvisations without any written stuff. So uh, yeah, we did two records, and we did you know a bunch of dates between here and San Diego and San Francisco, you know. Um, yeah, so Billy was you know, a lot of fun to play with. You know, he uh, definitely kicked my ass. Both he and Vinny. It was it was um it was a good time for me because <laughs> I got my ass kicked. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, somebody asked me to do to be in his band, and the real attraction for me was Billy and Vinny. And then like I'm we're playing at the old Alligator uh, New Music Monday series, and at one point they just start going off, and I just stopped playing, just going like. I'm so lucky to just be on the stage, like within five feet of these guys, just going crazy. It was, just, it was like such a special thing. I just thought, yeah, this is wonderful. You know, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Billy's a deal. He, I guess he's coming out here next week. He's out here with Ben Goldberg and um, uh, Bobby ba Bradford and Greg Cohen. I think it's uh, Ben Goldberg's um, deal. They're playing at the Oracle on the 23rd. Oh gosh, let me, yeah. let me write that so, down. I, I mean, I always write the oracle down, but because of it's, my... an, it's not an usual night for them. Oh, unfortunately, I can't go to it. <laughs> no, I'm in the studio that night. Shit, mm -hmm. that's too bad. Yep. So anyway, I, I think Ben must be doing some sort of um, 
project, recording project or something that they're, yeah. uh, I don't know for a fact, but, um, you know, considering that Billy's coming out here, uh, you know. I might have to move my studio date. <laughs> I don't know, man. That really sounds like a very, like, unmissable, right? You know? It's pretty good, yeah. <laughs> I can't move what I'm doing, so unfortunately, I won't be there. Um, originally, yeah, well, whatever. I, you know, if it had been two, if it had been Monday, it could have gone. But yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah, Billy's Billy's amazing. Yeah, really, he's an amazing, amazing artist, and he always has been. You know, so. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so. Um, do you write when you have a project or do you do you just write and then gather the songs you've written into a project? Well, I, I try to be project oriented because I want to have a, 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 you know, for lack of a better term, a sound world I'm interested in. Uh -huh. But like the, menton, the mentones are definitely like, that's that thing. Yeah. It's always going to be those four people if the, if, somebody moves away or, or whatever, that's not going to happen. Um, so I try to keep the, I like, I like band chemistry. Yeah. You know, um, so generally I write for projects. Uh, that being said, I have binders full of projects I've written for that I'll never be able to, to do because either, you know, people moved away or relationships fray or just there's not enough money. I mean, I, I probably have, I think I counted once I have 11 projects that I'll never be able to record, you know? So, um, you know, or CDs and not projects. So some of those I wrote enough for two CDs. So, um, you know, it's, it is kind of what it is. And then you just go like, well, I'm not going to do that. Maybe I'll do something else rather than write a bunch of stuff I'll never put out. So I kind of went the band camp electronic thing. Yeah. So I'm doing that a lot. Um, because at least I know I can get it done. And I don't have to rely on people saying, no, I can't make a rehearsal or, you know, or, or, or whatever. Yeah. I was going to say, you could do what Brad Dutz does, which is he just puts everything on Bandcamp. Yeah, well, that's what I, I, I think I have like 50 things on Bandcamp. Oh, really? Jeez. Uh, yeah. yeah. Over, over since like 2011. Oh, my gosh. And some of them are like archival things. Like I started putting up stuff I did in the 80s, yeah. some of the live things I've done with people. I did a base diary where every month I would like sit down for three or four days and like just do improvs. And then like, if there was one that was particularly bad, I would exit, but mostly I just did, I wanted to just have like warts and all, this is what I did. Yeah. So, um, I would listen to those for a while, but I, th that was probably eight years ago, something like that. So I just, you know, I, I, I was, I was sort of in this weird documentation thing, you know, Yeah. I'm just going to do this. Um, so yeah, I, I Bandcamp has been useful for that because, you know, otherwise people aren't going to hear it. You know, I mean, it may be only three people who hear it, but it's better than zero. Yeah, that kind of reminds me of uh, <clears throat> years ago at the Blue Whale, John Diversa. He had no. a trio. Can't remember all the group. I mean, I have I have his record with that trio. A really good trio, and um, <clears throat> he um, at that concert he said. We're going to give you each a CD so you can have our music. And if you want, you can put some money in the tip jar. And I I did that every now and then because I thought, you know, it's great. You have you. The purpose is to have people have your music. Yeah. And we all know we're not going to make a lot of, well, a lot of money, the money from CDs, you know. Yeah. And uh, so that's a way to make, it's just like a little exchange, basically. It feels Oh, yeah. A little good, you know. <clears throat> so, but yeah, I think, um, and the Bandcamp thing, Bandcamp is kind of like how CD Baby was at the beginning, you know. Right, right. You get the money and people can go and they they actually could just listen or they can, yeah, yeah. And, you know. Absolutely. Kind of a good, good setup. For sure. Yeah, I mean. <clears throat> yeah. What, do you have any... Uh, uh, I'm not sure of the question exactly, but talking about business for, you know, musicians, any, uh, well, you, you already mentioned early on that you did have gripes about what was going on 
with you and the business people. But at this point, how how do you see how do you see business going on right now? Music business. I'm, I'm so I'm so detached from that. I I have no idea. You yeah. know, I think that um, there's probably a lot of younger people who are really much more in touch with what's going on now because yeah. it's their world, not mine. You know, I'm, yeah. they're they're the ones who are who are like they know how to work all this stuff. You know. Yeah. They're the ones who are opening venues. I'm I'm just like not going to pick for the venue. You know? So, well, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, truthfully, um, you know, they seem to have this stuff worked out, you know, either people who are doing like subscription things on Bandcamp or whatever, I'm not going to do that, you know, um, so I, I don't know, I, I don't, I, the whole thing's sort of a big mystery to me, I, 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 I can't, I, I can't think about it because I'm, I'm not, a, that's not my headspace. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, let's see, um, I'm, I'm thinking at this, so at, at this point you have a, a pretty, it sounds like you have a pretty laid out path of your art. Like you sure. are always going to improvise no matter how you start it or what form you put it in. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I think that's accurate. I mean, to be honest, after the pandemic and some of the stuff that was going on, I, I actually had thought that I might not be playing live again. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then, then so he said, oh, let's do a tour in the Southeast. I said, okay, sure. And then <laughs> like, yeah, I guess I really need to do that. So I went from like, no, I'm not going to do it to like, you know, a bunch of gigs lined up. So, um, but like the stuff I've been doing on Bandcamp recently sort of starts off with um, either a couple of ideas just technically about how to deal with modular synthesis or a basic um, kernel of an idea and then I kind of spread out from that. So, uh, you know, basically it's playing in the sandbox or throwing paint in the wall and see what happens and then, yeah. you know, you know I'll, I'll sort of have an idea for a melody and I'll kind of improvise through it until I kind of like get it to where I want it to be and then I'll Put it into MIDI, yeah. Like orchestral instrument samples, and then, you know, because my time's not that good playing a keyboard, you know. So then I have to fix it up a little, or you know, and try to align things because I'm playing it all freehand. I'm not doing grid oriented stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so basically, yeah. The answer is I'm thinking through it, but yeah, basically, I'm, I'm improvising, and then codifying that in a more I think it's more like painting than I do think it's like music at this point, you know, just because it's it's all about color and timbres and not always about themes and harmonies. So that that enters in it too. You know. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um. <coughs> Dang, girl. <laughs> I, I have a chronic cough that I've had for That's years. Right. Okay. <clears throat> it's, it's kind of like an allergy, but who who the hell knows what it is? Um, um, <laughs> I was just thinking of, you know, this may be, I, you know, sometimes I'll get into asking a question like this, and so I, you know, I hope I hope that you can answer it, and if not, it doesn't really matter. Okay. <laughs> but so so what you just described is, <clears throat> to me, it I have a vision of of your path. And so I'm I'm just wondering do you is is what drives you just a personal feeling of necessity to do that or do you also have ideas of bringing something or things to a broader humanity? You know what I mean? I mean is it yeah. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer this by making a statement first. There's what, seven or eight billion people on the planet? Yeah. Right? You know, and um, the people that we consider really important, maybe a couple yeah. million out of the planet know about. So I, the broader humanity, um, I don't think it's possible, you know. Um, you know, I mean, Generation, generationally, people don't know some of the people that we consider icons in our lives. You know, you're just talking about the United States, let alone yeah. 
you know, what, whatever culture, you know, Tibet or, or you know, somewhere in Mozambique or whatever, there, there's, so um, broader humanity. No, I, I, I am interested in um, if somebody uh, likes what I do or has some resonance with it, you know, or kind of goes like, oh, I should try to do my own thing. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I find that um, the times that people have told me that those things have worked for them, I feel that I feel that's gratifying and I'm, I'm touched by that. Um, I'm a little embarrassed by it because sometimes that means they buy my stuff, which just always seems weird. <laughs> Friends buying my stuff. It's like, I just would have given it to you. Um, um, so there's that part about it. But the other thing is, like I said, I sort of have this evangelical, evangelical thing about the electric bass is that there's so much more that, that it can do that people aren't allowing themselves to think about. Or they just don't like it. I mean, that's the other thing. But um, I tend to think that um, I, I'd like to to um, present my thoughts, concepts about how the instrument can be used for different types of things. Yeah. You know? um, so, did you did you have mentors either when you started in this direction or before? You know, um, I, I did have uh, some mentors um, in uh, high school, strangely enough. Um, I basically had two teachers that were really important to me. One guy was this guy, Dorian Hichigian, who was originally from Culver City and now lives up in the, in the Central Coast. And he was, when I was 16 and he was seven, uh, 23, and um, I went to a hippie free school. And... Uh, he uh, was teaching us like jazz things and you know we were like blues rock kids who were learning like tune up or whatever you know and trying to like not completely suck at it um but anyway he would hire me for gigs and stuff like that i played with him for a number of years so i got to play with older people and i was sort of in my apprenticeship deal with people who were better than me which um so that was really important to me um growing up you know because like i met better drummers than the guys i was playing with in high school i yeah. met like professional drummers um, and the other guy was, uh, the original theory teacher left and they hired this guy, Dean Drummond, who was a Harry Parsh disciple. So all of a sudden, here's this guy, like the first time he walks in, he goes, well, this is your new, the old guy says, this is your new theory teacher, Dean. And we're like, oh, hi, Dean. And he goes, and this guy goes, yeah, I've been teaching them about jazz, like the good stuff, like, you know, not that Ornette Coleman stuff. And Dean goes, well, that's my favorite stuff. <laughs> and so we all just kind of like went joint. Um, but, you know, um, you know, so we went because of Dean, he would show us like the instruments he's building in his apartment, all this stuff. And so it kind of opened up that. And, you know, I saw one of the, uh, I think, I don't know if it was the only, but there was a big performance at Royce Hall of Delusion of the Fury. And it turns out like, like you know, years later, I found like the Kleins were there and all these other people who were like, sort of like, you know, in the avant-garde or whatever thing you were talking about were there. So like people yeah. that I, in my extended colleagues were there. Yeah. So both those guys were really, um, one in a more practical way, one in a more sort of conceptual point of the way forward. But Dorian also like, he went to Cal State North Church and he started telling me about Penderecki and all these like, you know, interesting, um, you know, modern classical for the that time period uh, composers and, you know, that he was into and I got into because this stuff was really good. So he also pointed me, you know, so I, ha I had, I had um, the benefit of that. And then, you know, like I said, I met Nels and that means I met Alex and I meet Vinny and those guys were already neat, you know, really, deep into this stuff and um and then weighing a little bit later um but all that led to um a context you know a community that that i became uh peripherally part of and then became more um more part of uh probably in the 80s you know mid mid to late 80s and then yeah. the 90s for sure <clears throat> that sounds old that's <laughs> the 80s 40 years anymore <laughs> i don't know does it sound old i don't know <laughs> yeah, that's because we're old. <laughs> I guess. I don't know. I don't, if some of my kids, they'd be like, oh, yeah, you're talking about before I was born, Gramps. 
Um, no, it doesn't really feel old when I'm talking, you know, with my friends and stuff. But then right. at some point, I feel like, oh, yeah. And then when I'm talking to a younger person, I, I sometimes I get this image of myself like, yeah, here's this gray haired old woman, you know, like she couldn't yeah. possibly be that hip. <laughs> Dinosaurs. Um, you know, and in terms of the mentor thing, like I said, Les McCann was super important to me. I, I learned so much from him. And some of it was just by osmosis because I was kind of a headstrong young dick, yeah. to be honest. Um, but he he um he really taught me a couple of things that have stayed with me, you know, to this day. Can you tell tell me one? Well, one of the things was he just turns to me and says, you know, if you're you don't have to play a lot of notes. If you're just going to play one note, make it count, which is sort of like, you know, um, I tie it to people like Charlie Hayden who could just like play one note and it would just be like, I know. So I sat around like, like practicing, like how do I make one note just sound like great, you know, yeah, <laughs> Godhead or whatever. So, um, you know, so stuff like that, um, you know, I, I mean, to me, that's sort of like, like I, I don't know for some reason that was a real kernel for me you know yeah it's, yeah it's make it um you know so i mean like in that first clip with benny i mean there's some there's sometimes i'm just not playing because it's it seems more appropriate you know, yeah yeah playing I me mean, somehow some people like like to play all the time i actually don't because i think that helps me shape things more which can be sort of an ego trip as as much of an ego trip as playing too much but uh, I just, I like it when people give each other space in improv things. Me know? too. Because then there's, you know, it breathes a little more. And there's variation. Exactly. I was dreaming about that the other night. Like one of those dreams, like, you know, you're thinking about it all night. <laughs> wow. It had something to do with space, like telling people uh, space is not, is not n no thing. It's a thing. <laughs> You know, has a personality space, you know, yeah, part yeah. of the music, you know. It's part of the music. And it also, it implies that there's trust in the other people. And I think sometimes people don't trust the people. To me, that's how I interpret it sometimes. It's like, just trust them. You don't need to play. It's all good, you know. So you, you can you can be the lead. You can be, you know, a uh, counterpoint. You can be a company or you can just like shut the hell up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it works for me. <laughs> um, yeah, so. <laughs> I have a, uh, a vocal group too. Well, I mean, I don't, we haven't worked, you know, since the pandemic, we really yeah. haven't worked a lot, but we, we've been together for like nine years called Fish yeah. to Birds. Uh -huh. And it's, uh, <clears throat> it's all improv. And, um, you know, over the years we've gotten into somewhat of forms, you know, like uh, somebody might do a groove for a while, you yeah. know, and then somebody else might improv um, harmonize with that or do a yeah. counter or something like that. But um, yeah, a lot of times, a lot of times we shut up, you know, <laughs> got to do it, you know, like something's happening and you're, you're just going to add cacophony if you jump in and it's, it doesn't serve the whole over, overall music, right? Sorry, how many people in the band? Uh, seven. Wow, yeah, you you do need some people to back off. <laughs> that's a lot. That's difficult. Yeah, yeah, that's brave. Great group, and uh, I don't know if we'll continue on. I mean, <clears throat> this the idea of vocal singing like that, improvisational and circle singing, it's gotten uh, much more popular in the last mm -hmm. ten years. You know, um, and. So you don't want to be viewed as a sellout then. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> What's one of your favorite all-time recordings? Some of my favorite all-time recordings? One of your favorite. Wow. Um, or, or several. Yeah, I mean, that kind of goes by decade and by genre. You uh -huh. know, I mean... Um, so like I'm, I'm going to force my wife assuming she uh, lives me to play a, a, a Mahler piece 
Uh, <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> a short one. It's, a, it's one okay. of those. It's not, not, not the Fifth Symphony. No, you're not. You're not, you're not you're there like like checking their phones. It's it's like a it's like a song, and it's like one of the best things I've ever heard in my life. Huh. I was a massive Mahler fan for a while. Um, so uh, that's that's probably like something I love. But you know, I mean, I. It just depends. I mean, you know, there's days when I'm only listening to Earth, Wind, and Fire, and then I have I love this this uh, Ukrainian uh, kind of like heavy metal band right now. Um, you know, there's yeah. a lot of new jazz I like. There's a lot of new jazz I don't like. You know, then there's like the whole Wayne Shorter, you know, Blue Notes. I mean, so it just it it just depends. I steal. I try to steal from everybody, but sometimes I'm just like I, you know, I, I go through phases. So. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Yeah. I have a friend who's probably listening, Dan, my friend Dan Davila, and he <laughs> he used to come to every concert that I would instigate. You know, look, for a while I was booking a club downtown called Barfedora, and um, so he would come every Wait, time. Sorry, Barfedora? Not Barf, but Bar Fedora. Okay, okay. So... Okay, so the bar named after the hat. Okay, I just I was, I was tripping. Sorry. I know I heard that joke a lot. It, I didn't it, name the club, so you know. It was, just, it was just I didn't get the space between the R and the F. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, so Bar Fedora. Yeah, and he would come every show, and um, you know, I think we were we did it for two and a half years every week, and um, not just once, but you know. So anyway, <laughs> at the end of the night, he'd look at me and he'd say, that was the best concert. And then the next night he'd say, that was the best concert. <laughs> we had a, this going joke, you know, because it was always great. We went to the Blue Whale and hung out together. And, you know, it was always great, you know, almost always great. Anyway, but. He's enthusiastic. Huh? He's, he's enthusiastic and he likes to hear music. Yeah. And in the moment, you know there's a lot of great damn music going on well, yeah absolutely absolutely yeah let's, Frightening almost. let's listen to something else okay what, what shall we listen to next? Uh, well i'm gonna i'm gonna uh see if i can't find something and then i'll tell you in a sec so uh keep them occupied for a moment la 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 <laughs> la la okay um so why don't we listen to uh, something off a of pomegranate? There's a tune called Widening Circles Reach Across the World. <laughs> Maybe I should try to send this, I don't know. Let me see if I can find it. Reach across the world. <clears throat> yeah. There it is. Yeah. Yeah, so this is uh, the, the stuff I was telling you about earlier and this is the Tom Barner piece. So these are, this is, um, is this, no. That was a kaleidoscope. So right, no, this is this is a long one, so we'll probably have to leave somewhere in between. Okay, okay. Or in the middle rather. Oh wow.
<clears throat> okay, I'm gonna stop because that's no worries. Yeah. Yeah, that was really beautiful. Thank you. I, I was reminded how what a bad mofo Tom Varner is on the French horn. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> that's awesome on that. I mean, everybody does, but you know, I mean there's a bunch of you know he has written stuff and he's got all those cadenzas he's playing and he's killing it he has some really great records on like soul note i think it is from uh, uh -huh. back in the day yeah really good composer too really interesting guy <clears throat> anyway um, we yeah. have a we have an artist from seattle on here joyce glasgow she said uh she loves the piece loved the trombone and it would make a good theme for a twilight zone episode <laughs> <laughs> um so I, I i'm just gonna tell you i got this review once um and sometimes i think reviews tell you more about the reviewer than the than the music <laughs> yeah. but um uh basically the person wrote about i think this is the first quartetto stig record he said don't listen to this record by yourself alone late at night in a house <laughs> 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 yeah, which is which is a really weird review, but um anyway, so yeah, okay, I'll buy the I'll buy the uh I'll buy the thing. But but it's it's not trombone, it's French horn that she's hearing. Just oh, there you yeah, go. I mean, yeah. Which, which, yeah, I mean he's he's you know a great jazz and other uh French horn player. So ama amazing player. And you know, I mean Fumo's on that, he sounds great, Jeff. Fumo, yeah, Fumo's on it. so good. Mm. Yeah, yeah, he is. Um, yeah, so anyway, that's more sort of like the third streamish kind of thing. It has a little of, you know, there's a lot of classical sort of writing technique in it, you know, yeah. theme the back in and all that stuff. Yeah. Excuse me. So. Third stream. Yeah, I mean, basically, you know, I mean, that's, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm probably not literally third stream, but it's third stream-ish. Yeah. You know. <clears throat> You know, Vinny does that a little bit with some of his his larger pieces that he's been doing recently. Yeah, I'm I'm never sure what to call the music for promotional purposes. Vinny thought about it. It's a new music. What he does, new music. Yeah. I I mean, who knows? I don't know. And because all these different terms, but third stream, I think that uh, that sounds like uh, yeah, maybe that makes sense. <clears throat> yeah. There's so many, there's so many hybrids going on, you know, um, yeah. the problem with calling it new music is it's new music now, but, but in three days, it's not new music anymore. Uh-huh, right. So, yeah, I mean, you know, really, it's just, you know, music. I mean, I, I don't know. I, it's, it's hard to, you know, people, people like, you know, it's, it's easier to say, oh, impressionist versus expressionist. It's easier to it, it make because then, then you get sort of like a visual idea of what it is. You know, yeah. if you say like free jazz versus cool, then you get an idea. So I, I, yeah. I, get, the, I get the necessity, but um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. So <clears throat> what exactly are you working on now? Right now? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I just, I just, did all this playing back east um and so i got back uh last thursday night and really i'm just sort of trying to get back into the rhythm i was before the rhythm i had before was just going out when i wasn't working i was just going out to my studio and working on all the synth stuff so i did like you know i don't know far five or six hours worth of music since last june and like a lot of big pieces you know 24 minute pieces um and then some smaller ones too uh so um, I'm just trying to get back in to figure out what my new rhythm is because I kind of finished what I was, the project, uh, that thing I was working on. So I don't know, that's a question. I have, I have, um, I was, before the pandemic, I had, uh, I had already written the whole um, book for a second album for the Mentot Six, which is a Mentons plus Tita Quartet, which is sort of an, an offshoot of that. Um, and uh, if you want later, we can maybe listen to some of that, um, uh, the Tea Talk Quartet. But I had a whole second book written. You know, we were doing, we we're getting ready to do rehearsals and then pandemic, no thanks. You know, uh, I had, uh, I have this, um, the second book or the third book for the, the Minim concept, which is going to be Vicki Ray on piano, 
Maggie Parkins on uh, cello, Brianna Gilcher on uh, oboe and, and uh, English horn and me. And um, we were supposed to do Jeff Schwartz's uh, Santa Monica Public Library gig. Pandemic wiped that out. So uh, I'm, I still need to finish writing that book. I have about, I think about two thirds of the way through that. So those are things I'm thinking about doing, <laughs> but I, I don't know, it's, I'm trying to figure out because you know, I sort of had the one thing and did the playing, gonna do some more playing and then I need to refresh and figure out what I'm, I'm doing next, if that makes any sense. So I don't know. That's a, that's yeah. a, that was a long answer for I don't know. I could have just said I don't know. <laughs> something. I'm doing something. Okay. <laughs> Made a bunch of noise and I put a weird beat onto it. And I just I just did a live live uh, takedown. I'm going to see if it makes any sense to me to do something with it. Yeah. Yeah. So, like that. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're giving you're giving me ideas. Oh, good. Well, I'm glad. Yeah. At yeah. least I, I'm having some yeah. use in this. <laughs> um joyce said she recently heard tom varner sitting in with sex mob in seattle that makes sense yeah he was a new york guy yeah okay so she knows who tom is okay yeah Did, so you can ask joyce joyce was he badass <laughs> <laughs> hey, joyce over to you <laughs> yeah, he's really he's like i said he has a couple really great albums they're back on the wall some over here, but um, he's, yeah. he's definitely somebody worth looking into, I think. Yeah. Do you teach as well? Um, the answer is not really, um, because I'm I'm uh, I'm more I'm more of an autodidact than anything. Um, I did have one really good um, classical teacher at at Northridge out of the three I had, and I learned a lot from him about about things, but um, uh, I used to teach kids like they wanted to learn Nirvana songs and that just doesn't interest me. Not because of Nirvana, I'm just like, so I, you know, I've, I've had a couple of students where it's like, I'd rather, you know, I just sort of talk to them about concept. I'm more interested in concept and what you want to get out of the instrument or, you know, how you hear yourself rather than me telling you something, you know, it's, you know, well, what do you, you know, what do you think about how you sound? Well, I don't like this. Okay, why don't we talk about how to get that sound? So I, I, I did I did have a couple of lessons with somebody recently, but it's not like something where I'm going to see you every week. It's yeah. Because I, I'm of the opinion you can't teach somebody how to play. You can teach somebody how to approach their playing or, or you know, critique, not be critical of the critique. You know, what do I want to hear? Self edit. Um, so the answer is no, but I'm giving you the philosophy behind why not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it's, frust it's frustrating to me because I don't, you know, it's like, did you practice? No. Okay. Well, why am I here? Yeah. It's like not, not worth my time, not worth your time. Do what you want to do. You know, if, if, you know, if, if you, if I'm not, if you're not excited by what I'm having you do, then I'm, I'm wasting your and my time, you know, yeah. and your money. You know. Yeah, it is hard sometimes. Uh, you know, I right now I have several younger students, one right. 15 and one 17. Uh -huh. And they're both very, um, they're talented. They're both mm -hmm. very talented. But the headspace, it's really, you know, and you don't want to, you don't want to be like, rant, rant, rant. That's, you know, definitely, you want to be like, how about this? And they, you want them to go, oh, you know. <laughs> right on. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's really, it's interesting. Te well, teaching is just, it's a, it's a trip for your own head, you know? Yeah, yeah. By the I'm way, Joyce said, great at always, it. I'm just not Tom's wondering. always a badass. That's what she said. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for the corroboration. And you're right. <laughs> and a nice down to earth guy too, she said. Yeah, he, he, he was. I mean, I've only met him like once during the session. I just, I was a fan oh. of his records. And when Jeff said, who do you want on the record? I said, well, I want, you know, because the idea was sort of like have some New York guys and some LA guys because Dressler was out in New York. I said, well, let's do Tom. And he goes, who? And I said, check it out. And he goes, oh yeah, that's great. So, you know, cool. sweetheart. And then you have, I'm sure this is a friend, Richard Gould Saltman. Uh-huh, yeah. Did and he, he said, say bad things about me? Well, <laughs> he said, Stu, you're looking a little shaggy. Oh, thanks, man. 
<laughs> You're right, though. I need I need to I need to trim. And, <laughs> and you know, the thing is, it's the eyebrows that are the worst, and they're not they're not going away <laughs> unless I shave them or something, which would be really horrific. <laughs> oh, Joyce said he Tom lives in Seattle. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, oh. he does live in Seattle. No, I I know that he's up. He's teaching at Cornish, I think it is. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I just haven't. I I need to get up there, but it's just you know, time and money and yeah desire and now apparently i have more of a desire to do these things yeah so. cool yeah. <clears throat> um let's see do you have any do you have any time to read do you find any authors particularly stimulating whether or not it's about the music or not i don't like reading about music um uh so the answer is i do a fair amount of reading um Right now, I made a commitment to read uh, the Mahabharata, so I'm on um, volume six out of ten. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, it's it's um, some of it's really, um, really pulls you along, and some of it's just like, oh my god, just get to it. You know, <laughs> there's, there's like a battle going on, and they already announced to you that the guys that that the, a main character is going to die, but basically you have to go through like 500 pages to get to the guy dying. Or not five, like two hundred, two hundred and fifty. It's like, please, yeah. you don't need to know like every single, you know. And and so and so sh shot thirty arrows into him, but he still lived. You know, I mean, so, <laughs> it's, it's pretty wacky. It's pretty, you know. Um, earlier on, it was all discussions of dharma and the right path, and now it's just like, you know, the beauty of the battlefield and all the dead bodies. It's really odd. Oh man. It's yeah. It's it's like you know. It's 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 an amazing. Um, document i guess but I, I had this i like mythology and i figured i should read it and i think i'm happy i'm doing that um but i, I wouldn't say i'm getting uh any super like immense musical inspiration out of it i have in the past for other things yeah like the whole mentot mentone thing is sort of like uh there's a lot of noir action in there i, I sort of named things after um, like Locust Land, the first record is named after Nathaniel West's Day of the Locust, you know, um, so things like that. One, another one's named after some James, sort of obliquely named after James Elroy thing. Another one's after John Fonte thing. So it's all LA based authors. So I do, I do. And like the, the pomegranate stuff, is those are all Rilke quotes. So yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I steal from <clears throat> that nature. You do get inspired by, yeah. Okay. Hey, let's listen to, was it TikTok? What is it? TikTok Quartet. How about uh, Wrong How Long? Okay. Oh, hold on. Let me get this together here. No worries. I'll, I'll talk while you're doing that. So the okay. basic idea behind this was the reason I called it TikTok Quartet is TikTok was a guy who allegedly or a legendarily taught Hank Williams to play guitar. And um, I figured that, you know, uh, American music and probably really worldwide music is um, very indebted to African American culture or black culture, however you want to, whatever the nomenclature is now. And so that's why I call it the Talk Quartet. It's sort of along the more um, uh, uh, it's, it's sort of more along the, the uh, the more sort of country side of things. Well, I'm sorry, what song did you want? Long How Long, but I mean, yeah, th that's the one I picked, but it doesn't have to be. I mean, Gone you know, How Long? I mean, Wrong, Wrong How Long. Oh, Wrong How Long. Okay, we have a number of them, but. Yeah, no, I have, there's, it's like 13, each one of these albums has 13 tunes on it because, you know, 13 is like a, you know, one of those kinds of numbers. <laughs> okay, are yeah. you ready? Yeah, oh, of course. Wait, I didn't. I don't think I started at the beginning.
cool. Yeah, yeah. so that, that's the uh, sort of more country meets Disneyland meets Anthony Braxton version of uh, the men tones uh, aesthetic, if that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious, you know, like standardly people talk about it and I experience it. You know, <clears throat> I go in the studio, I record. Right. Um, listening back is much mm -hmm. better later you know in a few days do you what kind of experience do you have do you like listen to it immediately and decide or i mean do you even edit or do anything to your projects <clears throat> um i don't like to listen immediately um you know, uh, often it's sort of, I, I go by what it felt like in the room, like on a piece like this, we probably did two or three takes. Um, and it was sort of like, which one felt the best, you know, maybe we'll fix it ahead or something here or there, you know, Wayne's really good at that, as you know. Um, uh, so, um, you know, sometimes people want to listen back. I, I, I don't like to do it just because I have a, uh, uh, self-esteem issues, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, but, you know, yeah, sure. I mean, some of these things like on, actually, I don't remember like on the pomegranate thing too much about it. Cause I, I didn't go in when they were like making fixes to stuff, but it was not in the days like where you could move everything around. And, you know, there was this, we did a couple big edits, um, like, you know, the, the first part of the tune was better. The first time we played, I think we only played each one like twice. And so we picked, you know, oh, well, this one's better for that part, that kind of deal. Um, um, but yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I, mostly it's like, does a reading suck? Yes, okay, I don't want to hear it again. Oh, it sounds better a year from now. Great, I'm happy. <laughs> like this didn't sound so bad. By the way, that was Scott Ray playing Dobro. He used to be a trombone player and then he switched to Dobro. Then he switched to lap steel, which is something else and now he's playing pedal steel so he's oh, wow. you know you know vicky ray yeah okay her brother oh so um yeah obscenely talented family of whom i'm quite jealous because they're <laughs> such bad mofos um and then dan Klukas is playing cornet on that um and nice. then it's joe from in the the rhythm section of the of the mentor yeah. Um, yeah that was very nice yeah yeah, so. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I was just curious because recording is just kind of such like like a whole different animal, you know, it's like, oh, right. God. for me, it's it's rough. I mean, I remember Sheila Jordan telling me I hate recording. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the process. You know, one of my favorite records, she's on that Steve Swallow album, Home. I don't know that one. You don't? Oh, it's a great record. It's I'll like write a, that down. So home. I believe that's I think it's on my wall somewhere back there. Yeah. Um pretty sure she's on that. Yeah. It's an it's a you know, it's an ECM record. I think it's like yeah. or something like that. Yeah, it's it's she's great on it. Um anyway, so yeah, she hates recording. Yeah, yeah. And you know, the vocal thing is so Oh yeah. Well, there's there's a number of things. For me, it's like <clears throat> Well, you, you, it's challenging to, okay, let's see, how do I say this? Okay, so as a singer, I could sing what's written on the page, sure. right? Which I'm not that great at. Uh -huh. I don't mean that I can't sing the melody. I can sing the melody, but there's nothing really that happens. Right so it's much better if I, if I get, you know, free with it, you know, and... Right. Uh, so, which I think really is, you know, the best thing that an artist can do in general. Right. And then from there, you know, the usual, like, did I do a good job or, you know, whatever you're, you're listening to the whole band. And then there's the tuning of the voice, which is really so particular to the engineer, you know, yeah, and <laughs> that can really be an interesting thing that actually, I was very impressed with Wayne that he could tune and you know from a live recording yeah. and he did you know and, and we did we did the job you know but 
obviously you you can't go over this little line to perfection because yeah. it doesn't, but, doesn't but you know I, I I think perfection's you know first off it's impossible and second off it's sort of then it starts getting airbrushed you know yeah so, you know my favorite singers are not people that ever had the opportunity to do any of that stuff <laughs> right you know what I mean yeah and, and they're they're people who have personality yeah exactly um and sometimes I think that's that's more important my my take on voice is that it's got to be really hard because it's 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 way personal and also because the people hear a voice and it you know you can hear a saxophone screaming and it's like oh the saxophone is screaming you hear somebody screaming and it sends a whole other psychological thing into overdrive you know because it, it becomes something else yeah and I, and I think that we key in so so intently on voice quality and timbre and inflection that it, it's it's got to be really hard to do what you do you know yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's got to be super nuts you know Cause... yeah and it's really i mean anyway at my age i'm really finding that most important is just me me communicating what i'm feeling right yeah i mean but uh, again like you know edith piaf i mean was you know was she a great technician i have no idea but you know there there's something she does that i've tried to figure out how to do on bass like she does this falling on i think it's Levian rose when she comes out of the whatever it is the bridge or and she calls and she falls down and like kind of like glides down it's just like it's nuts what she's doing you know yeah she's amazing yeah so i mean i don't like everything she does that gets into material but yeah. you know uh incredible stylist and maybe that's more important than technique yeah way. yeah yeah it's interesting okay. um i remember hearing actually uh yeah it was um uh joey sellers a, a recording he and a singer mm. um the singer was i guess you might even say i don't know if i'm using it correctly third stream because right she was free, but she was obviously classically trained, right and uh -huh. was in his music, which was improvisational, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. fantastic, really fantastic. And I think Mark Dresser used someone on a recording as well from San Diego. Probably, yeah. I mean, to me, that gets into a I, I the bel canto style sometimes it's hard because I grew up as a rock kid and a blues kid. So I kind of want to hear like a little bit of a grit, sure. you know, and, and <laughs> yeah. like the really ah! thing, even though I like, I like opera and I like, like, like I said earlier, Mahler songs, there's something about it. Sometimes they just go like, I really wish we were a little bit more real. You know? <laughs> it's too damn perfect. You know? <laughs> Does that make sense? I don't know. You know? Oh yeah. I think so. Um, what would you say? What do you think uh, is a description of musical maturity? Oh, God. <laughs> wow. Um, I, uh, well, you know, the thing is, anything I can say, I, I will just go like, yeah, I don't exhibit enough of that. So. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I think really it kind of comes down to uh, uh, you know trying to make it right for the music, whatever that whatever that means. You know, sometimes that means different things to different people. You know, just try to to make things sound good. I I, I don't know. You know, I listening. I mean, I play with people in like oldies bands and they, they didn't listen. You could tell they didn't listen to what else was going on. You know, I play with this drummer and he's like, the singer is singing, the, they count off the tune, but the singer leads into the downbeat and it's not exactly the down. I know where the downbeat because you can, ba -da 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 -da, bam, right? And he's, he's like, ba -da 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 -da. no, you're wrong. I'm playing the time. It's like, dude we're backing up the singer so you know paying attention i think is is a pretty big one you know yeah, yeah. being being listening and being in the moment i think is really where it's at but uh -huh. other than that I, I don't have a clue yeah 
Yeah. That's a deep question for me to. <laughs> I know. Sorry. You know, no, it's okay. I just, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how to. to... <laughs> um, do you have one or two um, favorite musical experiences that you could share? Oh, well, you know, I already sort of gave the, uh, the Billy and Vinny thing where I just kind of like got to sit there and like have them go nuts, yeah. you know, and uh, I actually had something like that. Uh, it's another thing where I just stopped playing and listened to the other guys. Uh, we were, it was uh, Julius Hample, the second tour I did it with them, it was a crazy band. Um, it was uh, Julius, Nels, Bill Frizzell, me, Alex Klein, and Juma Santos. And, you know, Bill and, wow. and Bill and Nels, uh, Bill it is, is more thorny, not as sort of Americana thing. Yeah. Um, and, but literally we're playing this thing and, and, Nelson, um, Alex go into this into this duo thing, and they basically played like like in lockstep for like five minutes by themselves, or whatever however long it did. And I was just like, oh, holy crap!" Because it was like they're just they're just playing ideas back and forth. You know, they're twins, so maybe that's part of it. But it was it was it was really a special moment to be on there. I just I just got to listen, you know, and I was like, within I'm just again I'm just really lucky to be here. You know, so there's things like that, you know, I mean, it's, it's not really about me. It's just like I'm there. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, well, you do some so many things in the moment. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's it's kind of hard to remember everything. Right. But I think in the moment kind of experiences really do impinge a lot, you know. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Totally, you know, um, You know, you know it is. You just try not to suck. At least that's my thing. It's like I'm trying not to suck. <laughs> and hopefully it feels good at the time, you know? Uh, yeah. And you feel like you, you made some good decisions. Yeah. Is there anything that you every now and then think about, gee, I wish I had done that? Or oh, yeah. Like a bucket like list daily, or something like that? Hourly. <laughs> <laughs> You know, what the hell was I thinking? Why did I do that? <laughs> yeah, sure. You know, the grass in the rearview mirror is super green. <laughs> what about a bucket list? Oh. What about the future mirror? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um, I just kind of want to get better at what I'm, whatever I'm doing, you know. Yeah. Um, it'd be nice if, you know, People go like, "Ooh, you actually play some interesting things on the bass. Yay, you!" Um, or like, "Gee, I like that music you made." You know, I. I that, that's kind of it, you know. Yeah. I, I don't have really high expectations, apparently. <laughs> you know, I don't have any real aspirations. <laughs> Damn it! Damn it! Um, yeah, you know, I, it'd be nice to do do a little bit more playing out of town. Because I, I didn't do it for a long time because I had kids and then other things and then the pandemic and yeah. I thought I was going to do it and then the pandemic happened so maybe play out of town more and yeah you know my dad my dad was a sax player and uh, I had twin sisters who were four years older than me and they uh, sang okay. and one played piano so that's how I grew up right and um, and so uh, I always joke that if my father had told me that I was going to have to get all my gigs, I might not have become a professional singer, you know? <laughs> so, but he, he never told me that. And by the time I even thought about that, I was in my late twenties, you know, so it was like too late. But um, yeah, so I, at, in uh, March, 2020, I was about to go back to Japan for three weeks oh, nice. and uh -huh. just, you know, canceled it. And Vaporized, I just yeah. haven't wanted to go back because, you know, a lot of times I teach in very small rooms and, yeah, sure. um, you know, that but now cool. they're opening up again. So yeah, yeah, I'm thinking next year I'll, I will create a, a little tour in Japan. Nice. I'll go for three weeks and I'm thinking of creating something in Europe because I haven't been to really Europe touring for ever, you know, probably 25 or 30 years. Sure. Uh -huh. 
So I'd like to do that. And yeah, uh, there you go. You know, you, you got you got an agenda. That's good. Yeah. But I'd like, you know, like when you said you were doing a uh, southeast tour, right. you know, I immediately went, oh, I want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I want to create little tours, you know, I, I want to yeah. do that. I just got off this whole thing and, and I was I was emailing uh, Dan Klukas about something and he and Nathan Howard and Kyle Model are going to go like do three dates and going like, God damn it, I'm jealous. I want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I think we're kind of junkies, you know, we get, we get the rush and then it's like you need to you need to get getting high, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it is pretty funny. That's what I always said about the competition thing, you know, because I was I I learned a long, long time ago that competition is not what most people think it is. It's really it's just your own personal spiritual path. Yeah. You're not doing the gig that someone else is doing. It's just because you haven't done whatever you need to do to have a gig like that. That's it. <laughs> it's not a big deal. Yeah. So but uh, yeah, but then so if somebody did a great gig, I would just get. Like kind of like what you just said, a little jealous, but inspired, you know, to go after it or to, you know, create something or whatever like that. So, yeah. You're much more mature than I am. <laughs> maybe, that's, maybe that's musical maturity right there. Maybe that's the secret. <laughs> I'm, I'm just like, God damn it. I'm a white. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> It's fun. I'm I'm glad. I, I mean, I'm glad that we're still working and doing stuff. And, you know, I mean, because a lot of people, you know, will give up, you know, because yeah. of whatever, you know, maybe their personal path doesn't include um, looking for a gig. Yeah. You know, stuff like that. Yeah. You know, I, th I think the thing is, is um, to me, it's just trying to be whatever creative means and I, I don't you know I there's times when like getting gigs seems like it's actually uh it, it ends up becoming something where you're playing so much that you actually stop growing because all you're doing is playing yeah um, I feel like I've seen that with people it's like yeah okay you're playing great but I'm I'm hearing the same ideas 20 years later and so uh, you know not not, not that anybody's hiring me to play, you know, for 20 years straight, but um, it's, I think, I think there's a lot of, there's a double-edged sword in all this stuff, you know, it's like, yes, I'm playing all the time, but what are you playing? Is it really, you know, and what, what part of you is it satisfying? Is it an artistic part? Is it a, a you know, community part? Is it a money part? You know, what, what is it that, that, that's satisfying to you? And, and, um, I don't know. It's it's that that was that's just me riffing. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. Um, well, no, that's uh, that's very pertinent. You know, I mean, when I think about you know, as I was listening to you say that, I thought about the gigs that I've been doing the last you know six months or so. Yeah. So I'm not working. Uh, to me, I'm not working a shitload. Somebody else might think I'm working right, right, a lot, yeah. but right. um, but the gigs that come up. I've I've been in my usual form. I've been you know having different bands because that's what I do. Yeah, I <laughs> and, um, but within that, I'm I'm feeling really good. You know, I'm feeling sure. like I'm making real music with various people, and sure. um, you know, I used to do. I used to have a desire to do different music all the time. Uh -huh, uh -huh. not repeat you know and yeah. in in these last few years i've been actually repeating songs to uh -huh. find um i don't know to find new expression in the moment uh -huh. with them uh -huh. yeah and I, I like doing that i remember seeing um benny Maupin um over the last you know 10 years um and he would be playing like three times a year. And every time he played, and I, I was familiar with his music, yeah, uh -huh. and he would play the same songs. But mm -hmm. it was always different because, you know, they'd play the head and then it was a new band. It was a new moment. And yeah. I just felt I, I'm very respectful of him. So I think, yeah, 
It's Benny Maupin, and he's doing that, and he's gaining. He's obviously gaining something out of that. He likes it. He's he right. finds it important to do that. So, yeah, I mean, I get. I actually practice standards all the time. Oh, you do. Yeah, it's, it's weird. Oh, but, um, so, I, and part of it's just because I think it's fun to try to play ideas through harmony. So to me, it's it's I practice the same standards all the time. Something they get bored and I have to find something else. Yeah, it's weird, right? No, <laughs> weird no, actually, that. there's a player who normally comes on and uh, he's a guitarist and he goes to UNT, but he, he many times he'll ask, what uh, standard do you go back to? to uh -huh. To play is there a, a few that you that you find really yeah yeah i mean i i mean i'm talking like probably people just go oh those are corny but i really like out of nowhere because oh, I, like, yeah. I like the major minor thing i like things like ladybird uh yeah so i i like i like tunes that that do things like that um uh my romance i think i do a lot uh, mm -hmm. i play through that a lot and, you know, sometimes I'll just like, oh, I'm going to play this tune, but I'm going to play it as a some weird groove in five and just try to play through the changes that way. Because then I I have to think about how the, the harmonies work and, and connective tissue and all that stuff. So for me, basically, I get I get the whole, what I'm, I'm just trying to say, I understand like the trying to repeat yourself and getting the depth out of it because you also learn new methodologies or strategies or, or what have you so yeah 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 it's very cool lately i've been doing um well it's it's an arrangement that my so when i've been mostly to japan i've traveled with a pianist named philip strange who's uh. kind of like a keith jarity player and uh. um so he and i came up with a lot of wild arrangements i'll send okay. you i'll send you a little bit yeah, please, of please. what we do but um so we came up with this arrangement of uh out of uh, out of this world uh, uh, i'm clear out of this world when yeah. i'm looking at you right it's a harold arlen song okay. but we're we're doing it like kind of open funky with a little bit of a minor cool. feeling oh. on it and it's fantastic it really sounds like a very different song and I can even get into like a speak singing thing yeah. and, you know, it invites the players to kind of to come in with uh, colors, you know, uh, yeah. it's really so you're, pretty you're cool. Pushing the on it then. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. That's pretty fun. Well, <clears throat> uh, well, it's been yeah. two hours. <laughs> cool. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I know at the beginning you thought two hours. I'm going to be. I just thought that I was just, yeah, I don't know what I thought. Yeah. I'm always nervous about these things. Well, like like I said, I, I'm i just so laid back. It's... No, I know that. Yeah, you need to be a little edgier, please, you know. <laughs> okay. I think you need. Next what time. do you mean? No, you're wrong. You have to get to <laughs> right. get in my shit a little bit more. <laughs> Are you playing somewhere that uh, people in LA can see you? Um, uh, well, I have, um, I, I, I'm playing, uh, actually Santa Barbara on the third with, uh, Michael Vlakovich and Garth Powell at a place called the Piano Kitchen. Oh yeah. I'm playing, uh, with the same band in LA at Open Gate Theater on the fourth. It's the old Open Gate location, not the new one because the new one, um, somehow cross booked. So we're going to the libraries. The, the, You're kidding. Oh, wow. They're, it's nice that they're opening their doors for you. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I, I think that required um, uh, a oh. key made of money. <laughs> uh, and then and then we're playing up in San in case it, people are losing other places, we're playing in San Francisco on the 9th at a place called Bird and Beckett, and then at uh, Nebraska, Mondays, I think they call it, uh, at Luna's in Sacramento. So that's what those, those are. And that's like, so basically the third and fourth, Santa Barbara, L.A., Ninth, San Francisco, twelfth uh, in Sacramento. So, okay, cool. Um, and then I'm playing. I I think I'm playing solo on the thirty first uh, of July at the Oracle series. Yeah, we'll see if I decide to go through with that. It seemed like a good idea two months ago <laughs> when I booked it. Now I'm not so sure. We'll see what happens. I already changed my um my my studio so I can go to the Oracle on. May 23rd to see Billy Mintz. 
There you go. I mean, you know, Ben's great. And ben, yeah. Greg Collins play with a million people, and and you know, there there's Bobby. So I mean, you know, it's it should be a great experience. Yeah, and just so people in LA actually get it, so there's a place downtown on Spring called the Oracle Tavern, and uh, Daryl Twos has been um, creating this new music series. Uh, the first, mostly the first and third uh, Monday, two Mondays. Mondays, yeah, yeah. It's called Vernacular. You can, if you're on Facebook, you can find it in Vernacular New Music. Yeah, um, yeah, and it's 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 been a lot of fun. There have been a lot of great bands uh, that came through. You were supposed to play there, but you know, you went on that bender, and <laughs> what can I say? Yeah, and, the, and actually, I saw you play. Uh, right before that, with I guess Ellen or Wayne or Wayne. I, I played with both. Oh, okay. and then uh, Roberto Miranda couldn't play with Wayne, so I was the sub. So I got <laughs> to play both sets. So I got I got to play two wildly divergent uh, sets because I was like one was like all sort of chamber kind of like improv thing, and one was heavier groove kind of stuff with uh, Wayne. I, you know what? I love Wayne's son. Oh yeah, he's a good drummer. He's a good drummer. Really good drummer. Yeah. He listens, which is, um, like I said earlier, is really important. You know, he's got a good feel, good time. You know, I hate him. <laughs> no, he's, you know, no, he's great. You know, and then Andrew Cask is playing uh, reads on that. So that was yeah. he's a great player. Yeah. So, yeah. That was a fun night. Well, thank you so much. I met you, by the way, I think that was the first time I met you in, the, in, in person. person. Yeah, I think so. Um, I want to say to other people, too, in L.A., please come out to Kulak's in North Hollywood because I'm, I'm, I've created this extra jazz venue. It's very inexpensive, really, to come out and hear, you know, even just if you're curious about somebody. They don't, they're not a typical venue. They're a recording, a video recording studio, really. So it's kind of like being in a studio. And uh, they don't have waitresses. You don't have to buy anything. It's easy to find. So Thursday, um, I have guitar night with, with Brad Rebuchin, who nice. uh -huh. yeah, in, I know. in my band without me at Oracle, <laughs> and uh, Andy Waddell. So um, apparently a really talented younger guitarist. Mm -hmm. So that's this Thursday, which is tomorrow, 8 to 10. Wow, geez. You know, easy. And then <clears throat> as far as uh, this show goes, I'm going to have, um, we're, we're having archives the rest of the week. Tomorrow is like just me blabbing on. And uh, Dana Stevens, he's Friday. You must know him, right? I don't think so. But like I told you already, I don't know many people. Really good sax player. Oh, nice. Okay. Uh, he's from the East Coast. You would, you would really like him. His, yeah. his whole thing is really cool uh dana stevens and then david links who's a singer from europe very interesting different kind of a singer this guy read all of james baldwin's books mm. and then he was like i think in his early 20s he went to a book signing in europe and met james baldwin and sat down and quoted uh. you know and james was like so impressed with the conversation, he said, well, if you ever want to come to France and, you know, stay with me, you can. So a year later, David packed up his stuff and moved into da David's house. Uh, I mean, um, yeah. Tough, yeah. Yeah. It's moved hilarious. into his house for like four years. James Baldwin's house. <laughs> Crazy. And then Sunday, Paul Jost, who uh, some of you listening know, great singer from uh, from the East Coast. So that's what's happening. Thank you again, Stuart, for being my guest and um, very, very fun conversation. Thank you. Thank you. It's big fun. Thank you. All right. And that is that. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great day. You too, yeah. Stu.